Hi, welcome to The Professor Speaks. I'm Raphael Chacon. I'm Professor of Art History and Criticism at the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana in the Western United States. I'm also the Director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to another of my series, this one on Roman and early Christian art. So we're gonna begin today with a lecture related to the pre-Roman peoples of the Italian peninsula. So bear with me as I turn on my PowerPoint and we'll get started. So we begin our discussion today with this image of the Mediterranean basin. And this is a part of the world uh, that the Romans actually called our backyard. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the term that they used for the Mediterranean Sea was il mare nostrum, our, our sea, our personal sea, if you will. Uh, and as you know, the, the Roman Empire was based at the heart of the Italian peninsula, almost geographically in the middle of the Mediterranean basin. And of course they ruled a vast empire beginning in the sixth century BC up until um, the, uh, the fifth or sixth century uh, AD. Uh, so it was a millennium in which they ruled uh, this vast, vast territory spanning from Western Europe, from uh, the Hispanic Peninsula all the way into the heart of Central Asia uh, and of course, North Africa. And of course, the Romans saw themselves as having a destiny to rule the world, and they are, in fact, the first great empire of the Western world, uh, following, of course, the Greek empire, which was uh, a vast in its own right. Uh, but the Romans themselves saw themselves as the heirs to the Greeks, and of course, they developed a civilization based on the, the underpinnings of the Greek world. But here, as you can see, are, in fact, the names on this map of the, the seas, mostly the, the, the water that surrounded the Italian peninsula and, uh, and their homeland. So there are many legends about when uh, Rome emerged as an independent state. One of those legends basically says that when uh, the last Etruscan king, Tarquinius Superbus, was expelled from the city of Rome in 509 BC, or before the Common Era, that the Roman Republic was indeed born. But prior to that, the Italian peninsula had a long history of uh, pre-Roman peoples um, settling there, or tribes that settled there, uh, developed a way of life, uh, mostly an agricultural way of life. Uh, and these folks uh, were mostly uh, spoke a, a language known as Sabellic. And uh, so it's a predecessor to, uh, to the, the, the language of uh, what we call Italian today. These tribes included people like the Apulians, the Feliscans, the Latins, the Oscans, the Samnites, etc. They frequently fought each other over grazing uh, of agricultural lands and farmlands, uh, where they tended cattle and sheep and goats and, um, and grew their own food. And so um, these people had sophisticated ways of life. Some of them lived in small settlements. Others uh, developed actually towns. Uh, they worshipped natural deities, the natural forces in the world around them. Uh, they made sacrifices, animal sacrifices to their gods. And increasingly, as they came into contact with um, uh, other uh, traveling peoples, particularly the Greeks, uh, they began to embrace the religions the, of, the, of the ancient Greeks, uh, namely their gods. They eventually became literate, and, uh, and many of them uh, spoke and wrote Greek, as well as other languages, including Etruscan, which is another language that emerges in this peninsula, and Latin as well. So, um, between, uh, uh, so those are the first peoples that inhabited the Italian peninsula before uh, the Romans developed their civilization. There were other peoples here. I've mentioned the Greeks. Between 800 and 400 BC, the Greeks began to colonize the southern part of the Italian peninsula, that is the southern part of that, uh, that uh, landscape that looks like a boot if you look at it on a map. So the southern part of the boot was colonized by the Greeks. And there are many uh, famous Italian cities today that were once originally Greek colonies, coastal colonies 
for this uh, maritime empire. So the city of Naples, for example, was once a Greek city known as Neapolis. We'll talk more about that shortly. But very, uh, a great number of famous Italian cities, uh, Pestum, Toronto, Agrigento, Syracuse, and in the island of Sicily, those were uh, in fact Greek colonies settled by Greeks actually and to a certain extent they were rivals but also uh, trading partners to those um, Italic peoples uh, who uh, dominated the line uh, the line share of the Italian peninsula and then there was another great tribe particularly in the north between the Tiber River uh, where Rome is uh, and the Arno River farther north and that central northern part of the peninsula was inhabited by a tribe known as the Etruscans. So we'll talk more about the Etruscans and their famous settlements uh, as well. So three major peoples inhabiting the peninsula before Rome became the civilization that it was. The, um, the Italic peoples of the peninsula, the original tribes of the peninsula, then the Greeks, and then finally the Etruscans. We'll speak about all three of them in today's uh, discussion. So here's a map that gives you a sense of how widespread those Italic tribes were prior to, uh, to the rise of the Romans. Uh, the, in this map, they're shown in yellow, and you see that the Samnites uh, were surrounded by other neighboring peoples like the Oscans, the Apulians, uh, the, Luc uh, the Lucans, etc., uh, the Sabines farther north, and the Umbrians. These people lived mostly to the east, uh, and north of the Apennine mountain range, which is sort of the spine of the peninsula. And then farther west, what we see are other smaller tribes, and, uh, and the large red block there is Etruria, the lands uh, populated by the tribe known as the Etruscans. But then farther south, what you see there in the olive green is in fact the area that was inhabited by, uh, by the Greeks. And of course, the Greek Empire was vast and important uh, as, a, as a maritime power, and, uh, and they would occupy large swaths of southern Italy and uh, the island of Sicily. And then I want to point out that their biggest rivals were the Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians inhabited mostly North Africa, but they also had colonies in the islands of the Mediterranean, uh, east and west. Uh, and they were great rivals to the, uh, to the Greeks as trading, uh, as trading peoples. So let's go back and talk about those Italic inhabitants of the peninsula. Uh, and I just want to point out, just uh, look at one group of people, and we know a little bit about these, uh, these ancient peoples known as the Samnites. We know that they were uh, warriors who established themselves in south central Italy near the modern cities of Abruzzi and Molise, and they spoke a language known as Oscan, and they shared that with some of their neighbors, um, their, the other tribes that, uh, that surrounded them. They uh, were loosely confederated with some of these tribes. At times they were partners, at other times they were rivals. They were often, in fact, at war with uh, their neighboring peoples, competing, if you will, for agricultural and grazing lands in the heart of the very fertile uh, Italian peninsula. Uh, we, know that, we know that the Samnites worshipped a trilogy of gods. Um, they looked at birds as sacred beings, and that they also had a rich funerary culture. In other words, they buried their dead and buried goods with them. And we know that they also, as the Romans uh, began to rise farther west uh, and began to expand and conquer their neighbors, um, that, um, that they weren't happy. And so they actually fought against the, uh, the rising Roman state uh, in, uh, in about the, fifth, uh, the 400 to 300 BC. And they also fought guerrilla wars in the fourth century into the third century BC. They formed a, uh, a, an alliance with uh, larger peoples, larger groups, uh, so like the Etruscans and the Umbrians and the Gauls, tribes to the north. Um, and sadly enough, that was a, an ill-fated alliance because that alliance was defeated by the Romans in the third century BC. Uh, but they continued to, to hold on, uh, to cling to their traditions, their language, their customs, their, uh, their religions, um, until they finally were, in fact, uh, defeated definitively by the Romans in what is known as the Social War in the first century BC. 
and in fact absorbed into the Roman Empire. And so aspects of Samnite uh, uh, life and tradition and, uh, and certainly beliefs were absorbed by their neighbors, the Romans, uh, that became a, an expansionistic empire um, uh, in, the, in, the first, um, in the last half of the, uh, of the millennium before the Common Era, before zero. So uh, as was true with most of the Italic uh, neighbors to the, to the Romans, the Romans absorbed their traditions and in some ways eradicated them as, uh, as individual independent states or independent peoples. Their tribes, those tribes became a part of the Roman uh, state and Roman uh, civilization. So let me again bring you, uh, zoom out to a much larger map showing us the, the Mediterranean basin. And what we see here is a number of different, uh, again, great states that, um, that precede the Romans as, as a, a great civilization. In blue, in dark blue, are, is in fact the, uh, the Greek empire. And of course, the Greeks were based in the Hellenic Peninsula. That's that, uh, that uh, large peninsula that projects there to the east of the Italian boot. Uh, it looks like a little hand poking down into the Mediterranean and it's surrounded by thousands of islands. Uh, and that was the, the homeland of the Hellenic peoples or the Greek empire. But of course it spread far east into the Black Sea and all along Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey. Um, and then uh, parts of North Africa were also part of the Greek empire. Certainly the Southern part of the Italian boot. And then also uh, islands to the, uh, to the west of Italy. And as far west as uh, the Hispanic Peninsula in Portugal, there's evidence of the Greeks as, uh, as, trade, as trading, uh, a trading force in that part of the world. They may not have colonized it, but they certainly had outposts. And, uh, and Greeks moved there. So entire communities of, um, um, uh, of Greeks moved to the west. For example, the city of Cartagena, in Spain uh, was known as Cartago no uh, Novo, or the New Carthage. And that was populated by, uh, by uh, Phoenicians, but also Greeks, uh, because the Greeks were in fact uh, uh, traders in the Western part of the Mediterranean. So uh, the Greeks formed a large empire known to the Romans as Magna Grecia, uh, or in Italian, Magna Grecia, Greater Greece. And, um, and they, uh, in fact, uh, monopolized a huge part of the economic life of the Italian peninsula prior to the Romans uh, and established many, many new port towns uh, and colonies on uh, the Italian peninsula. Uh, the city of Naples, as I mentioned earlier, was actually known as Neapolis, which is Greek for the new city. And it was populated by primarily Greeks. But other places pre uh, predominantly in the island of Sicily, like Syracuse, Akragas, Tarento, um, uh, uh, Agrigento, those were, in fact, uh, Greek, uh, Greek settlements. Uh, and as, as not just trading in oil and wine and other agricultural products, um, the Greeks made a lasting impression with their civilization, their culture, um, certainly their language, uh, but also their religion. So the Greek gods began to infiltrate uh, throughout the Western Mediterranean and began to be adopted by the local tribes uh, that inhabited those regions. Here again is another beautiful map showing the Greek colonies at about the sixth century, the middle of the sixth century BC. And again, as you can see, uh, given its proximity to the Hellenic Peninsula, the Italian Peninsula was an important uh, beachhead for, uh, for the Greek maritime empire. And I just wanna briefly point out that Greece has a long history, a millennium of expansion, development, uh, and it's really a remarkable development for uh, the Greek civilization. Uh, beginning in about 1000 BC, we begin to, uh, to see the civilization emerging, expanding, growing, uh, gaining influence throughout the Mediterranean. And the, really the climax of the Greek civilization is in the fifth century when the Athenians become the dominant tribe, the dominant, the leading city state of uh, a, a great alliance that formed the, uh, the Greek empire. Uh, and of course, all of that ended with um, Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC, 
um, and the rise of Rome, if you will, to, uh, to, to pick up the pieces where the Greek empire left off. The Romans, I can say with, uh, with some certainty, were great copycats. And the civilization that they most admired, they, they traveled extensively and knew many civilizations, including ancient Egypt. Uh, but the civilization that they truly admired um, were the Greeks. And so they emulated the Greeks, imitated the Greeks, copied them on, on many, many levels, and built upon the rudiments, the, uh, the foundations of Greek civilization or Hellenic civilization. But that Hellenic civilization had very humble roots, very humble starts. And just as evidence of that, I'll show you a, a very early, it's a model actually from the eighth century, a terracotta or ceramic model of a Greek temple. And it's a very simple structure. It's a wooden house for the effigy or the sculpture of the deity, uh, probably made out of wood and thatch roofing. Um, but it, it sets forth a precedent, a paradigm, if you will, that will be followed for centuries to come. That is of a kelum or a, 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 a room, um, which a sacred room where the priests um, uh, poured libations, made sacrifices, worshipped the, uh, the effigy, the statue of the Greek god under a covered roof, and then usually a porch in front where offerings could be laid by the general public or the villagers uh, to, their, uh, to their local gods. Um, this is in fact a precedent and it, was set, it set forth a model which would then be followed, elaborated extensively throughout the Greek world. The Greeks built phenomenal stone temples and in short order, in a matter of, of uh, a couple hundred years, they developed um, their, their temples into massive structures, the center of their communities, if you will, certainly their uh, ceremonial uh, um, ritual precincts, uh, special places in the landscape uh, where they worship their deities. And this temple idea become, is, is refined from generation to generation of, of builders and architects. And so here we see, uh, for example, two, two temples that come from two different ages in the same uh, location, in this case in, uh, in Italy. Um, here's another one in Greece that shows us, in fact, now uh, in, by, the, uh, by the sixth century uh, and the fifth, into the fifth century, really the refinement of the temple. And of course, what we're looking at are ruins, uh, the superstructure, the wooden roof, of the timbers are all gone from a building like this, as are the frescoes, uh, the, the brightly colored paintings that, that adorn these temples, and the, the statues, the images of the gods and the heroes that the Greeks um, admired and worshipped in, uh, in these buildings. This is, the, the, this is a model, uh, it's actually in Munich in the Glyptotech, the, uh, a, the National Sculpt Sculpture Museum in Munich, um, but it shows us the, the temple of Aphaia in Egina, Greece, um, as it looked when it was complete with its roof and its uh, pedimental sculpture um, and its, its walls intact. So not only do we see Greek architecture evolve uh, quite rapidly, particularly between the sixth and the fourth centuries BC, uh, but we also see that happening to sculpture. Um, th these are sculptures of a Greek athlete. And what we see is a steady evolution away from a kind of abstract, simplified human form that you see there on the far left. Uh, in that case, that figure evokes the kind of the planar, flatness of Egyptian sculpture, the rigidity, the kind of unnatural stance of it. Um, and indeed, the, the Greeks uh, emulated the Egyptians and knew uh, uh, Egyptian traditions, but slowly they began to evolve those traditions towards greater and greater, greater naturalism. Their sculptors prided themselves on not just giving us a body as it looked in nature, a body that imitated nature, but a body that moved, seemed to move and seemed to express itself as humans do in, uh, in life. And that is, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the acme of Greek art, particularly its classical art in the fifth century BC, that they arrived at this great level of, of naturalism. The figure that you see um, on the right is moving and seems to be breathing like a real human being. And of course, that is the great achievement of, of Greek uh, sculptors. Uh, this is, in fact, probably the most naturalistic of them all. This is a, a figure of a youth, a young athlete uh, discovered in Kritios, um, one of the Greek, um, uh, 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 Greek cities. 
So, um, so the Greeks prided themselves in this and they diffused this idea throughout their uh, vast trading networks. And the, the idea of naturalistic or imitative sculpture um, uh, became a precedent for, uh, for the Greek empire throughout the Greek empire and, and emulated by peoples throughout the Mediterranean basin, including Italy. Uh, this is in fact what the Romans most admired about uh, Greek art and civilization. Uh, the Greeks had a concept, by the way, of art that undergirded their arts, and that's the, the concept is called mimesis or imitation. Art is a representation or an imitation of life itself. And there are many words in the English language that derive ultimately from that Greek root of mimesis. Uh, so the word imitate, mime, mimetic, those are all words related to this concept of imitating life. Uh, and they did that not just in their sculptures, but they also did it in their paintings. This is a famous vase. It's known as a bilingual pot because it's painted in two different artistic languages. On the one hand, we have on the left side, you see um, the figures are in red figure. And on the right, the same scene of these two heroes playing a board game. You see the same scene, but rendered in black figures. And the, and the Greeks are basically showing off that they could render a figure in, uh, in two um, uh, quite different uh, visual languages. But what is important about Greek pots is that they capture for us, they give us a snapshot of the kinds of paintings, the frescoes, that the, uh, that the Greeks uh, surrounded themselves with. And the stress, the emphasis on this was naturalism, figures looking like life, moving, um, having the, pro the proportions of figures in real life. This is a vase, uh, excuse me, a, a, a pot, a, um, a large, cra uh, a large uh, uh, amphora, which more than likely contained wine. And you see, in fact, figures reveling or dancing in a kind of party uh, and they, um, they're holding Greek vessels in which they were drinking more than likely wine. So uh, these pots are, are evidence of the mastery of Greek artists in, uh, in the second dimension. So I mentioned that, uh, that the Greeks, in fact, had settled in large parts of southern Italy, mostly the regions of the, the tip of the, of the boot, uh, the region known as Calabria and farther north, Apulia and Campania. And there we see a number of cities going all the way up to Naples there in the, uh, in the western part of the, uh, uh, the western seaboard of the Italian peninsula. Uh, all the towns that you see here were Greek, uh, Greek ports. And then notice that Sicily had its share of those, um, of those uh, Greek settlements as well. And by the way, I'm showing you an, uh, a map on the right and then also an aerial view, a Landsat photograph of Sicily and the tip of Calabria. And that little uh, white speck that you see there is in fact the famous volcano of Mount Etna. And that brings up the point that why is Sicily so rich in terms of its agriculture? In fact, the Romans knew it as its breadbasket, the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And a good portion of the Italian peninsula is volcanic. In fact, most of it is volcanic. Uh, and, uh, and Etna, of course, is one of the, the great volcanoes of, uh, of Italy today, uh, still an active volcano. Um, and it's those volcanic soils that made for a very, very rich agricultural setting uh, for all kinds of, of goods um, that were then traded by, uh, by people like the Greeks and eventually by the Romans. So I'm taking you down to Sicily where, uh, to a site known as Agrigento, which is one of those port towns in the southern part of, the, uh, of, that, uh, of that island. And here we can actually see a great Greek city. Uh, that is in fact a Greek temple there. And in the distance you see the modern city of Agrigento, but the ancient city is, uh, is intact in, in so many ways. And this is the view from that temple looking out to the Mediterranean. So, uh, this view hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, there are indeed modern roads and railways and that sort of thing, but this is more or less the same view that, uh, that ancient Greeks would have had from their temples and their city, uh, the heart of their city in the, in the, in the town of Agrigento. This is what uh, an artist's rendering of what that, uh, that temple complex looked like with its great temple sitting on a bluff overlooking the Mediterranean. And then you see the, uh, the actual city, the settlement, uh, of, uh, and the fields surrounding that uh, in the distance. And this is uh, the Temple of Concordia at Agrigento, which is virtually intact. It's one of the most complete um, Greek temples 
in the, uh, the, uh, the Greek world, and it is indeed in Italy in uh, modern uh, uh, Sicily today. And this sculpture that you see here was found at that site. And this is a, uh, a Greek statue of a youth. Uh, and it's currently in the museum there at Agrigento, um, a beautiful sculpture of in that naturalistic style of the fifth century BC, that prized um, naturalistic style of Greek art at that moment. Okay, so we've talked about the uh, original inhabitants of the Italian peninsula, the, Samnites and their fellow uh, tribes, uh, the Italic uh, peoples. And then we've also talked about the Greeks as a major, um, major traders uh, building port cities in southern Italy and Sicily. And now I want to talk about another tribe of peoples, and these are the Etruscans. And they are important, particularly in the northern part and central part of the Italian peninsula. The Etruscans was an early tribe that came here and they were not Italic speaking. Their language is in fact an alien tongue. They were unrelated to those Samnites and Umbrians and the Apulians and the people who inhabited that uh, the Italian peninsula. They're linguistically of a different stock and maybe ethnically of a different stock as well. Their origins are murky. The uh, hist ancient historian Herodotus tells us that they were Lydians, that they were immigrants actually who sailed from ancient Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, across the Mediterranean, around the, um, the Italian boot and settled in the Turanian seacoast of Italy. So that is its northwestern uh, uh, seaboard. Uh, and they settled there as probably as early as 1000 BC. So they were contemporaneous with those Italic tribes just south and east of the Apennine uh, mountain ranges. Um, and so, uh, but what is true is that by 800 BC, they were already interacting uh, quite forcefully with uh, both those Italic speaking peoples and the Greeks uh, to the south. And by 700 BC, they had a flourishing civilization in this north central part of the Italian peninsula. They were so important that they actually began to conquer some of those Italian peoples, including the Latins to the south. And we know that between 616 and 510 BC, they were in fact, they had conquered uh, the place that we call Rome today. And they had kings ruling out of that place. So ultimately the Romans had their revenge on the Etruscans by reconquering them and conquering their territories by about 200 BC. But for a long span of history, the Etruscans ruled in modern day Rome. In fact, it's the Etruscans who built the sewers of ancient Rome and began the whole system of walls that we identify with the later Romans. So one of the things that is true about the Etruscans is that they left us a evidence of a great and fabulous material culture. A fabulous material culture that would inspire the, uh, and, and predict in some ways the way the Romans would organize themselves and adorn themselves as a people, as, as a civilization. So if the Greeks were important to the Romans, so were the Etruscans. And here I'm showing you a map showing us the, uh, the, a great number of Italian cities that uh, derive from the uh, Etruscan settlements. So Florence, uh, Perugia, uh, certainly uh, um, uh, Cerveteri, Tarquinia, these are, these are modern Italian cities that have Etruscan roots. And there are many, many, many more than what you see on this, on this map. So um, this is another map that shows us, in fact, when the Etruscans had formed a league, if you will, when all these little city states were in fact bonded together and began to expand Etruscan civilization and who their neighbors were. So to the north were the Gauls, the ancestors of the modern day French people. Uh, and then to the south, of course, were the Latins um, led by the Romans. And then those Italic tribes uh, south and east, and then far, much farther south, of course, the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Okay, and then this little map is interesting because it gives us a chronology of how Rome begins to expand. And you'll notice that the Roman Empire begins actually to move first to the north to conquer Etruscan lands, and then it eventually conquers all of Etruria, conquers all of the tribes east of the Apennines, and moves south into those former uh, Greek lands. 
So Rome, for whatever reason, we'll talk more about this in future lectures, begins to emerge out of its shell and uh, it begins to conquer its neighbors, including the Etruscans. But for a long time, the Etruscans were a major, major force in the Italian peninsula. Similar, related to sharing civilization with the Greeks, but really their own thing, their own civilization. This is, for example, a, an Etruscan temple. And if you, it might look familiar to us in many ways, but it's very different from the Greek model. It, it's in fact a more Oriental, a more Asian style temple than even the Greeks had. Uh, but it shares some things, you know, the idea of a, a room where the effigies were held, the gods were, were held, a front porch, a raking roof um, to cover the whole thing, sculptures on the pediment, etc. Um, but as you can see, it's a very different uh, looking temple. It's a temple that was lost during Roman times in the Italian peninsula, uh, namely because the Romans emulated and preferred the Greek style temple. This is a view showing us uh, a, a, um, the site of Cerveteri in Italy today. And this is, uh, Cerveteri has a fabulous uh, um, Etruscan cemetery. And you see it in actually an, excava in, in an excavated part down uh, at the lower part of the screen. Uh, and then in the upper part, what looks like mounds uh, under a lot of vegetation, those are uh, also tombs. Etruscan tombs, in this case, um, unexcavated. They have been explored, but not excavated to the extent of the ones to the south. And what these tombs tell us about the Etruscans is that they were a fabulously wealthy and cosmopolitan people. Uh, they spoke their own language, they had their own script, they had their own uh, deities, et cetera, et cetera, but they were also in league and in conversation with the greater Mediterranean basin. Some of their art, and I'm just showing you a piece of jewelry found in, uh, in the, one of the tombs at Cerveteri, uh, has, uh, the jewelry demonstrates evidence of trade with uh, as far east as the Near East and Mesopotamia, uh, Central Asia, Egypt, etc. Those sorts of themes emerge, uh, appear in Etruscan art, sometimes leaving us wondering whether, in fact, the Etruscans developed those things on their own or they were simply imitating the, the fanciest things from their neighbors or actually trading in the goods from these uh, neighboring peoples. But the importance is to know that they were, in fact, quite wealthy and, in fact, quite, um, uh, quite cosmopolitan in their, in their uh, worldview. And we see that in their own indigenous sculptures. For example, this is a sarcophagus uh, for a, a, a box that held the remains of a couple, a man and woman. And we see them actually sculpted on the top of this, um, this fabulous sarcophagus, a reclining couple. And already we notice that there are some things that look familiar to us about, uh, about the sculpture that looks particularly Greek, but there's a lot of things, idiosyncrasies that in fact are Etruscan. Uh, the gestures, for example, are really unintelligible to us. We can't really read them because they are indeed Etruscan gestures. Even some of the fashions that they're wearing, the pointy shoes are Etruscan shoes, not necessarily Greek, uh, Greek clothing or Greek hairstyles. The Etruscans were their own people and they had clearly had their own culture and their own indigenous autochthonous uh, traditions. Uh, this sarcophagus splits down the middle and the, the bodies were then laid uh, inside uh, that way, and then the thing would be sealed together. Uh, that's very different from most sarcophagi we see, like the Egyptian sarcophagi, where you have a lid that sits atop the box. Uh, so again, another idiosyncrasy of the Etruscans themselves. But increasingly, what we see is they're leaning towards their neighbors, and in fact, embracing um, the difference, embracing the culture of other civilizations. This is, for example, a, um, a, a sculpture in ceramic. It's life-size. It's 5 feet 11 inches, so it's a very tall image of, a, of the figure of Apollo. And we know that this came from the roof of the temple at Portonaccio, um, the Portonaccio temple in Vei in Italy. Uh, so it is, in fact, an Etruscan temple. But here we have an image of a Greek god. And in fact, this looks like an archaic Greek sculpture in terms of the style, in terms of the drapery, in terms of the, the pigment, the, uh, the fabulous color that is still on this, uh, this architectural uh, sculpture. Uh, this is a, a, an 
a, an Etruscan sarcophagus of an individual uh, by the name of Lars Pulena. He was buried in this box. And some of this looks familiar to us, and mostly because the Romans picked up these traditions uh, from the Etruscans. But here we see the reclining figure, and now the sarcophagus is, it has a true lid um, on the to top, uh, and then the box of it decorated with images. And those images are Apulian deities. So the figures holding uh, hammers and knives and the winged figures, those are Apulian gods, not Greek gods. Uh, the text that, that, the, uh, that Lars Pulena is holding is in fact in Etruscan, not in Greek or Latin. Um, here's another sarcophagus, only this is actually more of, of a funerary urn because at some point the Etruscans began to cremate their dead and then uh, hold the ashes in urns like this. And if this looks particularly Greek, it's because the style is very, very Greek. So again, the Etruscans were trading with the Greeks, borrowing from the Greeks, imitating the Greeks. Um, this is a typical Etruscan tomb. This is carved out of volcanic stone called tufa. And what it shows us is a large room, an ample room, with lots and lots of carvings of the tufa, which is an amazing stone. It has great tensile strength, and you can actually carve it with imagery related to the lives of the Etruscan dead. Uh, shelves were carved into it where the bodies were laying, the sarcophagi or the funerary urns were placed. And then also benches were created, carved out of the stone, allowing the families of the dead to gather inside the tombs to revel in, uh, in, uh, with their dead uh, after, their, uh, after their passage to the other side. And some of these tombs are actually frescoed, and they are remarkably frescoed. And these frescoes don't really address death. What they address is, in fact, the life of the Etruscans. For example, this one in Tarquinia uh, is known as the Tomb of the Leopards because of those two uh, uh, leopards that you see at, uh, just below the, uh, the vault of the room. But it has remarkable paintings of a scene that could have been replicated in ancient Greece, a symposium, a gathering of friends uh, uh, lounging on their, on their, uh, on their couches, uh, speaking, chatting, talking, and drinking. And there's a servant boy holding a, 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 a pot, um, bringing, uh, bringing some more wine to the revelers. Another scene from the Tomb of the Leopards showing us a reveler holding a kylix in his hand, a Greek style vase uh, or a drinking cup, and then another one playing a, uh, a, uh, the pipes. So these frescoes are, are surprisingly Greek in their style. Um, and that's because again, more, and, and it's entirely possible that these could have been Greek artists working for uh, Etruscan, uh, Etruscan uh, peoples here in Italy. Here's another one. This is known as the Tomb of the Baron, uh, which has wonderful scenes of horse, uh, horsemen uh, riding their horses and uh, a central group of a male and, uh, and a young boy bringing, playing instruments and bringing gifts, more than likely libations to an effigy of a god or perhaps a goddess or priestess. Here's another tomb, uh, the tomb of the augurs, also in Tarquinia, that uh, it has two prophet-like figures standing at a symbolic gate, a gate that more than likely represented the passage to the other side. And we know that the individual who was buried here in this tomb was more than likely an athlete, a wrestler. Uh, and that's demonstrated by the scenes that we see, these highly naturalistic images of wrestlers painted on the walls of this uh, Etruscan tomb. One of the most famous Etruscan uh, sculptures is the one that you see here. And I'm talking about the image of the she-wolf. And there's some debate as to when this sculpture was actually uh, uh, made. It's a bronze, so it's a metal sculpture. It was cast in bronze. And uh, some people believe that this is indeed an ancient Etruscan sculpture. What I can tell you is that the little, uh, little figures of those boys suckling from the teats of the, of the, of the wolf are not Etruscan. Those are actually Baroque sculptures. They come from the 17th century, 17th century, yes. Um, and they were added to this sculpture, mostly in emulation or evoking an evocation of the story of Romulus and Remus, the ancient myth about the origins of, of the city of Rome. Um, and apparently Romulus and Remus, according to the myth, were raised by a she-wolf. And this is known as the Capitoline She-Wolf because it stood on the Capitoline Hill for many, many years 
in the Roman capital. But more than likely, it's an Etruscan sculpture, a naturalistic, beautiful, uh, life-size sculpture of a wolf um, uh, from the Etruscan world. And we know that the Etruscans uh, cast bronzes, lifelike naturalistic bronzes, uh, particularly of animals. Uh, so here again is, a, is an image of those little later uh, additions to the, uh, to, to the sculpture to form a narrative group of Romulus, Remus, and the she-wolf. You might, uh, and just to end here, you might mistake this statue uh, for a Greek sculpture because we know that the Greeks cast bronzes. You might mistake it for a Roman sculpture because this looks like a Roman individual, a portrait of a Roman individual uh, standing in a toga. But it's not. This is an Etruscan sculpture. Uh, this is an image we know as Aule Metale or Aringatore in Italian. And this comes from the city of Cortona in Italy, uh, which was an Etruscan settlement. Uh, this individual is an orator, a, a public speaker, uh, a known public speaker. And it shows us, in fact, the wealth, the, uh, the capacity of Etruscan artists working probably in concert with, uh, with uh, Greek artisans who, who populated the entire Mediterranean basin at this time. Uh, but it is in fact the precedence that the, the, the Romans will emulate. Uh, as, and it, as, in so many, as with so many things, the Romans imitated the Etruscans, absorbed their tradition, and ultimately absorbed their, um, their, uh, their land and their peoples into the, its, uh, into the Roman civilization. And, and, and most importantly, there is a seamless sort of connection between uh, Etruria and the Etruscans and the Roman state. According to legend, Rome came into being, that is the Roman Republic, uh, as an independent state only when the last Etruscan king, Tarquinius Superbus, was expelled from the city of Rome in 509 BC. And so we'll end our conversation uh, here with that, uh, with that idea, and we'll pick up uh, the next time talking about the development of the Roman uh, state as an independent uh, civilization. Thanks for your attention and don't forget to like this on the bottom of your YouTube uh, screen. Thank you.